All right, uh, let's do uh, the exam review uh, for vertebrate adaptations. Um, this is uh, just a little bit overwhelming, uh, the amount of material that we've covered. Um, I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, and I feel for you. Uh, this is insane. Uh, so uh, let's do this. Uh, let's simplify this as much as we possibly can. Uh, I think perhaps in a in a non-COVID semester, uh, we I would have handled this a little bit better, but um, we would have had more quizzes or something to that effect. But uh, right now, this is crazy. So uh, let's keep it as simple as we possibly can. Uh, let's start um, with the most recent material and work back. Uh, what you could do uh, just uh, to get yourself started uh, is to download uh, the vertebrate adaptations final from the fall of 2002. Uh, so that's on the web page. Just go right here. Uh, we'll go over that at the end. Uh, we're going to throw a bunch of it out. Uh, we'll keep some of it. Uh, what I'd like to do is just concentrate on the most important points. Um, and if that's what you take away from this class, uh, I'm going to call that a win. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, let's keep it as simple as we possibly can. Um, and let's uh, take it from there. Uh, so uh, let's start then um, by talking about um, the rodents. Uh, and there are just a couple of things uh, that I want to uh, keep in your mind, and there are only a few things that I'm going to ask you about um, on the exam. Uh, so uh, the first point, uh, if you think back to the, uh, to the rodent lecture, and I don't know if this is exactly how it was, but this is the same material uh, that we covered. Uh, we made a couple of points. Uh, number one, that uh, we consider rodents and lagomorphs together, and there's a reason for that. Um, and number two, that the rodents have been highly successful, uh, the lagomorphs uh, much less so. So I don't care if you remember exactly how many families or species. Uh, that's not important. Uh, what is important is uh, the reason why we consider them uh, together. Uh, and that comes down to uh, a couple of very simple characters. Uh, the first and most important of those is the fact that these pterygoid processes uh, here reach back almost to the auditory bullae and uh, almost touch the auditory bullae. Uh, rodents and lagomorphs are the only groups that do that. Uh, no, other, no other mammalian group does that. So that is the key uh, unifying characteristic. Uh, there are some other characteristics that relate to the fact that um, you know, if you look at that suture that exists between the, uh, the premaxilla and the maxilla, it's curved in both groups, uh, and a few cranial characteristics like that unite them as well. But the key is going to be those pterygoid processes. So on the exam, if I ask you what unites the, the rodents and the lagomorphs, it's those pterygoid processes. Okay. Um, the next important thing that we talked about uh, was the fact that um, rodents, and, uh, rodents in particular have been insanely successful compared to other groups, uh, and that's primarily a consequence of the jaw. Uh, remember, early on, uh, I said that the most important things in life are food and sex, uh, what I, and that should be clear to you by this point right? Uh, you need to have food uh, if you're going to reproduce, uh, and life doesn't go on without reproduction. So it comes down to um, how you get food, how you process the food, uh, and uh, how you reproduce. So if you understand food and reproduction, uh, you understand life. Uh, and rodents are really good at this, uh, and the reason they're good at it is because of the subdivisions in the uh, masseter muscles and the fact that they're able to take that jaw and it's a mobile jaw. So it's not locked in place like it is in carnivores. It's mobile. And that allows them to process food to a degree that other animals cannot. Um, the next, uh, so when we look at those, remember we divide them up into um, three groups. Uh, and these were at one time considered to be taxonomic divisions. Uh, that's no longer the case. But they are siuromorphous. Um, morphologies for the skull, myomorphous or hystricomorphous. So squirrel-like, mouse-like, 
or porcupine-like. And if we look at those uh, skulls, there, there we go. Uh, if we look, whoops, that's not the one I want. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, if we look at those, the Sioromorph, the Sioromorphus one is figure B here. Uh, so you notice uh, there's this groove in front of the zygomatic arch. So you have one masseter which is pulling the jaw forward and the other one which is pulling it up. Then you have the myomorphous condition where you have this infraorbital foramen right here, and one of the masseters is actually coming through that. The eye is situated right here, so this muscle is going to come underneath the eye and then um, uh, have its origin on the rostrum. And then the hystricomorphous one looks like this, and now you'll notice both of these um, are going in the same direction, and notice how large that infraorbital foramen is. So it's absolutely huge compared to the mouse-like condition up here. And what that means is, and, and you'll notice both uh, masseter muscles are going in roughly the same direction. And if you think about uh, hystricomorphous rodents, um, you understand that what they're doing, right, much of what they're doing, whoops, uh, much of what they're doing is all about... Um, See if I can move. I'm trying to get this. Uh, you can't see it very well, unfortunately. Uh, let's see if I can change this a little bit. There you go. Whoops, had it for a moment. Uh, if you look at it, uh, you can see that both muscles are going in the same direction. Okay. Uh, and if you think about hystricomorphs, uh, they're very good at gnawing on wood and things of that sort. So in that regard, it makes perfect sense. All right. Uh, the other attribute uh, referred to the jaw, okay, and we talked about two different jaw morphologies. Um, we talked about um, jaws that were, let me see if, ah, there we go. Uh, we talked about jaws were that were siurignathus or jaws that were hystricignathus, okay? And this is, again, one of these where I need to move it up a little bit. Uh, so the siurignathus jaws is where the vertical ramus is in a straight plane. So here you see the cornoid process. You're looking down on top of the jaw. The cornoid process is in a, the same plane as the angular process down below. So here is the sayurignathus jaw, and here is the sayurignathus jaw. So everything here is in the same plane. For the hystricignathus, the angular process is angled out like this. You can see that here, and you can see it here. Of course, what that means is the surface area for insertion of the masseter muscles is considerably larger. So animals that have his strichognathus jaws are going to be capable of generating bite forces that are much greater. So the success of the rodents comes down to myomorphy, hystricomorphy, sayuromorphy, and or sayurignathus jaws or hystricignathus jaws, okay? Uh, there is that primitive or that ancestral version, uh, protogomorph, uh, and that was on this illustration right there up at the top. There are no extant forms that have that particular morphology. All right, so the big thing about rodents is masseter muscles, the, the mobile jaw, right, and then the form of the jaw, whether it's sayurignathus or hystricignathus. Also, all rodents have a diastema, that space between the incisors and uh, the premolars and molars. That's consistent. Remember our other discussion, and that will show up here in another diagram somewhere. Tra, tra, tra. Let me find a good one. There, well, yeah, that's not a particularly good one. It doesn't show what I really want to show. Um, uh, well, the the other the other point that I'm trying to make is that this suture line, which is coming up here, right? So these uh, those incisors are embedded within the uh, within the uh, premaxilla bone. And that suture that exists here, right on the posterior margin of the premaxilla, 
angles up and it curves. And what that does is it increases the total length of that suture. Um, and therefore, by having it not just straight up and down, but curved and having it longer, that's going to increase the, the strength of that joint. Uh, very good. Uh, we also made a point about um, hopping, right? And animals that are saltatorial uh, have few cervical vertebra, so lack of neck mobility, uh, which if you're hopping, you don't want your head flopping around all over the place. Uh, remember, we also see that in the cetaceans. Uh, the cetaceans have... Um, uh, uh, compressed cervical vertebra, and that too is to limit neck mobility. All right, uh, let's continue on past all of those guys. We had talked a little bit about uh, the anomalurids and the petite today. Uh, I'm not going to ask you any questions about those. Um, and we talked about the evolution of gliding, which is uh, clear that I would do that because that's what I um, enjoy. Uh, let's go all the way down to the lagomorphs now. Um, so we're going to skip past all of those guys. Uh, and we want to talk about two different uh, kinds of lagomorphs. Uh, the oc oc oh, Christ. Um, the oc uh, the Acotonidae, right? So those are the pikas. Um, and then uh, the lepords, which are the rabbits. Uh, so they haven't had anywhere close to the evolutionary success that the um, that the rodents have had. Uh, they both, however, have uh, these peg-like incisors um, behind the front incisors. So remember, rodents have one upper and one lower incisor on each side. Um, the lagomorphs have two upper and one lower on each side. And if you look at the lagomorphs, that second incisor is right behind the first incisor. So they are in line. Okay. The other thing to note is that they have a fenestrated rostrum. So only the lagomorphs do that. In other words, they have these windows here on the side of the rostrum. Um, the next point um, that I want to make is that in pikas, those incisors are grooved. So there's this groove going down there like that, and there's a little notch at the base. There is a rodent that does that, and that's the harvest mouse, okay? So harvest mice in the genus Rhythrodonomies also do that. They have this groove that runs down like that. All right, another important thing, um, if you look at the dentary bone, uh, that dental symphysis between the two dentaries in um, in rodents and lagomorphs is not fused, uh, so it's, it's cartilaginous, it's mobile, and these animals can take the two lower incisors and move them around, use them like a pair of forceps. Okay, that's it for um, the rodents and lagomorphs. Those are the, the two key points. Next, um, let's look at the carnivores. And let me bring that over there like that. Um, there are a couple of points uh, that we want to worry or that we want to think about um, with regards to carnivores. The first is that we divide them up into two groups, the caniformia and the filiformia. So the dog-like carnivores and the cat-like carnivores. And that's a basic division based on the presence or absence of the allosphenoid canal. So the allosphenoid canal is involved in the carotid circulation. Uh, caniforms have the allosphenoid canal, um, filiforms do not. And that's a character that holds up most of the time. We're not going to worry about the exceptions. Okay. Uh, the next thing, um, uh, when we look at them, uh, the auditory bullae are um, a little bit different as well. Um, uh, the filiforms... Um, in the filiforms, those auditory bullae are subdivided. So the auditory bullae is made up of two bones, the tympanic and the endotympanic bone. Um, and in caniforms, it's just the one. All right. Uh, furthermore, we also divide the carnivores up into groups. And these are, um, uh, uh, these are pretty clear. Uh, we talk about the feather-footed uh, carnivores and then the split-footed. So the feather-footed carnivores are the pinnipeds. So those are going to be the 
otobinids or tereids and phocids, those are the seals and sea lions, um, and then the walruses. And then the split-footeds are the fissipeds. Those are the cats, the dogs, the, the um, mustelids, and all of those sorts of fellows. Okay? Remember, when we talk about carnivores, the big thing about carnivores is what's going on with P4 and M1. So the upper fourth premolar and the lower first molar, those things form the carnassial teeth. And you see that in this illustration here. Uh, let's see if I can make that bigger. All right, you see that in, in that illustration right there. Notice that what happens here um, as we're going from a lion to a hyena, dog, uh, a marten, a mongoose, and then a bear. In all of these guys up here, P4 is essentially the, the major last um, uh, cheek tooth, right? And it's that slicing and dicing tooth. It works like a pair of scissors. And what that means is uh, the mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa are going to be like a lock and key. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, the fossa is the C-like structure that locks the lower jaw into place. There's no lateral movement. It's up and down like a pair of scissors. And these guys up here, um, A through E, are all hypercarnivores. Okay? So these are animals that slice and dice. The subsequent molars do almost nothing. In the bear, it's different. Bears are not hypercarnivores, right? They are more omnivorous. P4, that that carnassial tooth in the upper jaw, um, is just one, and it's a relatively small tooth. And you look at M1 and M2, they are much larger, okay? So bears are not hypercarnivores, but they are still carnivores. They still have that carnassial tooth. All right. Um, let's see what else. The other thing that we talked about with regards to carnivores uh, was the other important thing um, was the fact that they have uh, an os penis, right? A baculum. Uh, we talked about um, induced ovulation in carnivores uh, and why that might be related to the presence of the os penis. Uh, we also talked about uh, fusion within the wrists, right? So the scaphalunar lunar is fused, okay? And what that means is that there is uh, any, there's a total loss of wrist mobility. So a bear can't wave at you or anything of that sort. If you think about how a cat or a dog processes something that they've grabbed, uh, the wrist moves in one direction only. So it's different from the condition that we have they fused these bones right here into one solid unit. That's fine, uh, because what enables them to do is to uh, move forward, to, right, to run very rapidly uh, without any um, instability. All right, we also talked about uh, digitigrade and, and plantigrade, right, whether the animals are running on their toes or on the palms of their feet. Uh, cats and dogs are uh, digitigrade, uh, things like bears are plantigrade. Uh, we talked about uh, the difference in skull shape. Uh, felids have a very short rostrum. Uh, canids have a very long rostrum. Having a long rostrum gives you a lot of nasal epithelium, and that means that you have uh, you can have a very keen sense of smell. Cats don't smell particularly well. Uh, dogs uh, have an exceptional sense of smell. Uh, we talked about uh, whether a llama tree is driving the shape differences here, right? Whether a bobcat is just uh, at the other end of the allometric scale from a lion. Uh, that would be an interesting PhD project. Uh, nobody has ever investigated that. All right, we talked about hypercarnivores. There will be no questions about those guys. Uh, da -da -da -da. Oh, we did talk about... Um, uh, teeth. We, when we compared the tooth row in a spotted hyena with uh, the tooth row in an aardwolf, right? The aardwolf is also a hyenid, um, but obviously it's lost all this dentition because it's an ant termite specialist. Uh, we talked about herpestids. herpestids. Um, this is a mongoose. Uh, herpestids and vivarids. Herpestids have a, a, a relatively uh, even coat coloration, so there are no stripes or spots or anything of that sort. And their ears are nicely rounded, right? Uh, vivarids um, 
have stripes and spots, and they have pointed ears. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, foxes, Arctic foxes, and countercurrent heat exchangers and things of that sort. Um, just very cursory kind of material there. Okay. Um, very good. Uh, let's leave. Oh, uh, and then we did talk about the difference between uh, what goes on with the otoreids, the eared seals, uh, and then the true seals, the phocids. Uh, the otoreids, the eared seals, um, they are able to bring their hind appendages underneath the body, and consequently their uh, pelvic girdle is much more pronounced. Uh, and when they're swimming through the water, they're using their four flippers more than anything else. Um, but they can move around on the ground. Um, phocids, on the other hand, cannot bring those uh, posterior appendages up underneath the body. Um, and when they're swimming, uh, they're using uh, dorsal ventral undulation to a much greater degree. They're absolutely worthless uh, when they're out on land. They do come out on land, uh, but they have a hard time moving around. All right, uh, let's put those guys away, and then let's um, start talking about cetaceans a little bit. Um, there we go. I'll move these over here. Uh I just want uh, to make a couple of points about uh, cetaceans. Uh, we talked about um, the possible groups from which uh, cetaceans could have evolved, um, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, the earliest cetaceans that we know about are um, Bacillosaurus and Zoiglodonts, um, and all of these guys are uh, prob were probably there at the end of the Cretaceous and. Uh, evolution probably took place in the Tethy Sea. Uh, you saw the little video clip uh, which uh, illustrates that. Even Zoiglodon is, um, has a whale-like or a fusiform body plan. Uh, there are a couple of points uh, that I want to make about these guys. Um, number one is, why is it that the fossil record for cetaceans is so poor? Uh, well, it's if you're aquatic and you die, um, as you know from whales that have washed up on beaches, uh, they are quite ripe. Uh, they're filled with, once they're dead, they're bobbing on the surface um, like a cork because they're filled with all these gases of decomposition. Uh, and when they ultimately rupture, everything on the inside is rotted. Uh, and as it sinks to the bottom, it's going to be widely dispersed. Uh, so it's very difficult to find any of the fossil material. Uh, secondly, uh, the only fossils that you're going to find are going to be in sediments that have been uplifted. Uh, we don't do a good job of digging fossils on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so it's not surprising at all that the fossil record for cetaceans would be uh, relatively poor. Um, we talked about um, this early divergence of, uh, of cetaceans into two groups, right? The archaeocetes are the first group. Uh, and then we talk about the divergence uh, between the baleen and the toothed whales, so between the mysticeted whales and the odontoceted whales. Um, there is a question about whether whaleness evolved once, twice, or three times, right? It probably evolved once, right? And there was an early divergence somewhere in the Eocene uh, to produce the two lineages that we have today. Uh, we talked about... Um, what it means to be a baleen whale as opposed to a toothed whale. Uh, there are certain forces operating on baleen whales. Uh, there's compression of the cervical vertebra to limit, it, limit head mobility. The baleen plates are going to be, whoops, you guys can't see that. Uh, the baleen plates are going to be suspended from the upper jaw. Notice how the upper jaw in this case is nicely arched. There's a mandibular stay back here at the back of the rost, at the back of the uh, dentary so that when the jaw opens, its range of motion is going to be limited. Also, uh, baleen whales have these uh, grooves on the ventrum here like that. So when they've got a mouthful of water, it's like a giant balloon. It just fills up with water. Um, and then as they contract those muscles, they're going to force the water out uh, past the baleen plates, uh, and they'll be able to swallow the krill that's left behind. Uh, so... Um, the other point uh, to think about when you're thinking about cetaceans is they are good examples of gigantism. They are, some cetaceans are absolutely huge. 
Uh, and the question becomes, could a small rodent or an insectivore have made that transition from being aquatic to, uh, or from being terrestrial to being aquatic? Uh, the answer is probably no. Um, there are thermal benefits to being large, right? Uh, and you just have to think about, for example, what happens to gray whales as they migrate from the Chukchi Sea uh, down to Baja. Um, they, the females do not feed on that southward migration because the biggest problem they face is overheating. Uh, so as gray whales migrate south to Baja from the Chukchi Sea uh, in the Arctic Circle, uh, they're frantically trying to get rid of all the blubber uh, so they can dump heat to the warmer waters in Baja. Uh, when they make the northward migration with the calves, uh, at the end of the season, they're feeding uh, frantically, trying to put the blubber back on. But clearly, these are animals that uh, their biggest problem is dumping heat, not staying warm. All right, um, I'm going to skip all of that. Uh, another point that we made concerned um, the asymmetry that's in the skull of odontocetes. Uh, the melon sits right on top of the skull right here. Uh, so the nares are coming up behind the melon. Uh, and that's that asymmetry, which is probably enabling them to uh, not only detect sounds uh, that are incoming, uh, but also to project sounds out. Uh, owls do a similar sort of thing. Owls, the ears are offset in owls. Uh, for the same reason. All righty. Um, there's one other point that I will... Oh, yes. Uh, telescoping of the skulls. Um, if you look at a horse here, right, compared to um, Bacillosaurus and a dolphin and then a baleen a whale, uh, you notice what happens to the, the nares. The nares are migrating farther and farther and farther back. Right. Uh, and then what that does is it enables you to if if you're evolving from a terrestrial form to an aquatic form, uh, that ability enables you to spend more time feeding uh, in those um, nutrient rich uh, grounds. Uh, remember, we talked early on in the lecture about what um, groups are most likely to have given rise to the cetaceans. Uh, we know it's an ungulate. Uh, early ideas were that it would be a perissodactyl just based on stochastic uh, principles. Uh, the perissodactyls were much more abundant uh, early in the Eocene than were the artiodactyls. Uh, now, of course, artiodactyls are more abundant than um, the perissodactyls. The perissodactyls are the horses, tapers, and rhinos. Um, so here is a perissodactyl, right? Um, but the modern genetic evidence uh, and some uh, physiolo or some uh, biochemical evidence seems to suggest that it would not have been the perissodactyls, that it would have been some artiodactyl form that would have done this. But that question has not been resolved. Okay. Um, I think that's all I want to say about uh, the cetaceans. Uh, Oh, no, there, there is uh, one other important point. We talked about diving uh, and how whales dive. Uh, you saw the video about diving. Uh, and uh, remember what cetaceans are do. They exhale before they dive. They don't inhale. Uh, why is that? Uh, that's to reduce the cost of getting down to the bottom. Uh, it also uh, minimizes the chances of getting the bends when they come um, back up. Uh, they shunt blood from the periphery to the core. They have reti, reti mirabili, so they, they store all that uh, blood with oxygen around the spinal cord, the heart, uh, and the brain. Um, let's see, uh, what else? Uh, there's something, oh yes, they, the, um, the chest cavities are able to collapse, right? Um, because of the extreme pressures that they have to tolerate. Uh, they have high CO2 tolerance, um, and they exhibit bradycardia, so they slow the they slow the um, heart rate way down, uh, and they have high levels of myoglo uh, myoglobin. Um, if you've ever um, if you've ever encountered a whale skeleton, they are insanely oily. Uh, so when a whale when you find a whale skeleton on a beach or something like that, uh, it is really slimy. Uh, and part of that is because of all the oils that they maintain um, in the in the skeletal system. Uh, 
so it is there's a bar in in California in Southern California uh, near Newport Beach called Blackies, uh, and the bar stools are all made out of the vertebrae from uh, gray whales, uh, and they had to go through an awful lot of work to get the oils out of those um, out of those uh, bones out of those cervical vertebrae. Uh, it takes a lot of dipping in alcohol and things of that sort to get them cleaned up. All right, um, that's enough of the cetaceans. Okay. Uh, so those are the key points that I'm going to address on the exam. Very good. Uh, now, um, let's see, we've done carnivores, we've done rodents. Uh, oh, we need to talk about the evolution of birds. There we go. Uh, just a couple of key points about the evolution of birds. Uh, obviously, we talked a little bit about um, the top-down versus bottom-up hypothesis for the evolution of birds, um, and that is a point of contention, especially for those that are arguing that birds are dinosaurs. Uh, remember that birds are, for all practical purposes, just uh, reptiles with, uh, with feathers. Um, what features unite birds and reptiles? Well, uh, birds and reptiles... Um, uh, birds have a single um, occipital condyle, which is exactly what reptiles do. Mammals have two occipital condyles. Um, in addition to that, uh, birds have one inner ear bone as opposed to three in mammals. Reptiles have one inner ear bone. Uh, birds have uh, seven some odd um, bones in the, in the lower jaw. Mammals have only one. There are some bones on the inside that are not illustrated here. Um, red blood cells in birds and mammals are nucleated, or rather in birds and herps are nucleated. In mammals, they are not, with the exception of there's one marsupial, uh, and camels have nucleated blood cells. Uh, birds and reptiles have amniotic cladoic eggs with a calcified outer shell, um, with the exception of monotremes. Uh, mammals don't do that. Uh, birds have feathers. Feathers are nothing more than modified scales. They are derived from keratin, just as the scales in reptiles and just as the hair on your head. Okay, so it's uh, just modified keratin and that's it. Uh, birds have two kinds of feathers. There are the downy feathers, which are insulative, and then there are the uh, flight feathers, which are asymmetric. Um, modern birds don't have teeth. Um, Modern birds, have the flight engine is fused, right? So they have uh, not only a furculum, uh, which is this structure right here, which holds the, um, the anterior part of the girdle uh, rigid. Uh, they have a large keeled sternum. All of these vertebrae here are fused. Um, and then uh, the pelvic girdle is uh, also all fused. Uh, there's a lot of mobility in the neck, right? Um, but there's a reason for having that all fused and that's so that you can get this sufficient uh, flight um, going on. Another important thing uh, with respect to birds, they have pneumatic bones, uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, the lungs are flow through, so it's not like your lungs where it's intake, exhale, right? This is a flow through system. Uh, so there's no expansion or contraction of the chest cavity, which would obviously change the aerodynamics. Uh, as they fly. Um, yes, there is one other point that I wanted to make about uh, the skeletal system, and that is this. Uh, the muscles that lower the wings or that bring the wings down are the pe pectoralis muscles, and I don't recall if it's pectoralis major or pectoralis minor or ziphi humoralis, which of those it is. The muscles that bring it up are also the pectoralis muscles, and there's this little hinge joint here so what birds have done is they've changed the point of origin on one of the pectoralis muscles, uh, or rather the point of insertion on one of the pectoralis muscles, so that it's no longer coming to the uh, ventral portion of the humerus. Instead, it goes over a little pulley and attaches to the dorsal surface. Uh, so all the muscles that are going to bring the wing up or down are here on the bottom. Okay, So the center of mass of the bird is below the wing. And that makes it stable and easy um, to maneuver. All righty. Uh, we talked about that. Um, 
and we can leave that alone. I'm good. We're going to forget about all that stuff right there. Okay, very good. So those are the key points uh, with respect to the evolution of birds. Very good. Uh, let's pull up um, the final exam uh, for vertebrate adaptations. Um, and some of this stuff uh, we've not done. So uh, let's go through and um, just uh, pass right over this. We may have talked about it a little bit, but um, there's so much on our plate already that we're going to skip much of this. So uh, we didn't really talk about high frequency sounds and, and why bats would do that. We uh, we briefly talked about CF and FM bats, uh, but we're not going to worry about that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cover, we're not going to worry about those guys. Uh, what's the advantage of passive acoustic sampling? Easy. It's damn hard to catch bats, uh, especially out here in the Midwest. And, and a lot of bats are uh, on the rare and endangered list, uh, and you can't get permits. Um, so it's just it's just easy to do it with uh, bat detectors. Okay, what's the disadvantage? Uh, getting it right. Okay, so uh, we don't even need to talk about those things. Uh, we're going to cut those off as well. Okay, so don't worry about that stuff. All right, uh, we didn't talk about that. Knows that we didn't talk about that um, function. Oh, you know what we did not talk about? Uh, in the evolution of mammals, uh, and this is just an aside, uh, and I'm, oh, that probably comes up later in this exam. Uh, we'll leave that. If I, if I, for, if I better mention it now, otherwise I'll, I know, I know I'll forget. Um, remember the distinction between monotremes, uh, marsupials, and placental mammals. They all have placentas. The difference is monotremes are very reptilian-like in their girdles. Monotremes have cloacas, uh, and monotremes have extremely low body temperatures, and they don't have um, organized nipples. So they do have mammary tissue, but they don't have um, mammary um, glands that empty into a, a, a teat. Um, so they are very reptile-like. They lay eggs and all of that sort of stuff. Marsupials um, do have a placenta, but remember, they give birth very early. Uh, so uh, most of the development takes place in the pouch. Why? Because they haven't solved that um, immunological problem associated with uh, rejection of the foreign tissue. Um, and then in placental mammals, uh, the, plus, the, um, the developing embryo is uh, retained throughout gestation. Another important thing is uh, marsupials have lower body temperatures than placental mammals. Okay, very good. Uh, tra -tra, let's uh, not worry about all of that stuff. Uh, diving response in mammals involves, well, we just talked about that. Can you commit suicide by holding your breath? No, you can't because of the vagus nerve. Okay, why are the lungs evacuated before diving? We just talked about that with on the cetaceans. Um, and that's because you want to uh, minimize your chance of getting the bends. Uh, the diaphragm in whales is oblique and thus is able to lay flat against the lungs when the animal dives. That is a true statement. Okay. Uh, 12 is a true statement. Um, 13 uh, is a, a true statement. Uh, snakes are a daughter group of lizards. Um, we didn't talk about uh, amphispianids. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. Um, we are not going to worry about legless lizards versus snakes. Uh, we're not going to talk about the brilla. Um, the eyes of snakes are... Uh, so here you have to know the difference, difference between vestigial and rudimentary. Uh, rudim a rudimentary structure is one that uh, is just beginning to evolve or develop. A vestigial structure is one that is left over, uh, and the eyes of snakes are vestigial. Uh, so snakes have a fossorial origin, um, and as a consequence of being fossorial, uh, they lost their eyes, their good vertebrate eyes. Uh, 
Uh, they then reinvaded the terrestrial habitat, so the above ground habitat. Uh, so snakes have had to reinvent the eye. Uh, and what they've done is they've developed this clear scale which lays over the eyes. So they don't have eyelids. They can't wink at you or anything of that sort. Their eyes are open all the time. Um, but the retina is unorganized with respect to rods and cones. They are unable to focus um, in any meaningful way other than by changing the uh, aperture of the pupil. Um, so they, they are fundamentally different. So the eyes of snakes are vestigial, not rudimentary. Okay, most snakes focus their eyes by uh, um, da -da -da changing, da -da -da -da, squinting, changing the shape of the eye. Is that true? Changing the, no, not changing the position of the retina, changing the position of the lens. Ah, uh, we're going to ignore that one. Very good. Okay. Uh, within the eyes of the snake, uh, yeah, that's, I, the um, rods and cones are highly unorganized. That's a true statement. So 19, the correct answer is A. Okay, we're not going to, there's not going to be any essay questions. Okay. Uh, we didn't talk about giant snakes, uh, forked tongues. Why do they have forked tongues? Uh, because they uh, triangulate. But we're not going to worry about that material. We're not going to worry about that. We're not going to worry about that. We're not going to worry about that or that. Okay, we did talk about thermoregulation. Um, and uh, we did talk about the fact that um, thermoregulation in snakes is different in, in lizards, and that's um, primarily a consequence of the fact that they have uh, bodies that are um, going to do a lot more conduction, right? Uh, so temperature regulation in snakes differs from that in lizards because uh, they have to uh, contend with greater conduction. Uh, that's true. Um, they have higher surface area to volume ratios, uh, that's true as well. Um, C is not true. Um, D is not true. So A and B are true. So the correct answer would be either A or B or A and B. All right, 28. Uh, the fact that snakes have extreme skull kinesis while legless lizards do not indicates that snakes have solved a problem that legless lizards have not and are able to consume prey much larger than their heads. That is true. Uh, snakes have kinetic skulls. Remember that whole business about having a diapsid skull design? Um, snakes are the extreme version of that. So 28 is a true statement. Um, What's the primary advantage of sidewinding locomotion? It minimizes um, contact with the surface, which is important if you're on a surface that is extremely hot. Okay. What uh, following features do varanids and or helodomatids share with snakes? Um, they uh, have some level of venom, venom or toxin. Uh, the helodermatids uh, and the varanid lizards are both are both poisonous. Uh, so Komodo dragons have uh, have venom. Um, it's not nearly as potent as what you find in a lot of snakes, but uh, it is still venomous. And uh, they also have relatively long necks. The varanids have relatively long necks. Uh, they all have forked tongues, uh, and they have some degree of limb uh, reduction. Uh, a single row of ventral scales is not one of those attributes. So snakes have a single row of ventral scales. Lizards do not. Okay. So for question 30, A through D would be correct. All right. What's the major benefit of endothermy? So that comes back to the evolution of mammals. Um, what's the big deal about endothermy? Uh, it's not more efficient than ectothermy. So not A. Uh, it is not more efficient than heterothermy. Um, ah, here we go. Uh, it permits activity and thus reproduction throughout the day and year. So the correct answer for 31 is C. What's the major cost of endothermy? It's energetically expensive. Okay, it takes a lot of energy. 
31. What problem did Bartholomew's desert iguanas face when they wore little paramiscus fur coats? Um, they were unable to heat up. Okay, remember that story about George Bartholomew um, sewing the little paramiscus fur coats. And so they were unable to heat up. So remember, our discussion is what came first, um, a high metabolic rate or the insulation. Uh, it seems unlikely that in an evolutionary sense, they would both happen at the same time. Uh, so uh, we still don't know, right? But it's clear that if insulation came first, uh, that they would have never been able to heat up. All right. Uh, why is it unlikely that both would evolve at the same time? Uh, that's because it's like, um, that would be like buying uh, two lottery tickets on the same day and both lottery tickets are winners. So each event is a low probability event right? One of them happening is low probability. Both of them happening at the same time, you would multiply those low probabilities so it becomes infinitesimally small. Okay, so the correct answer is they are both rare, okay? Okay, which of the following attributes uniquely define the mammals? Uh, not homeothermy. There are reptiles um, that are homeothermic. Uh, B, denary squamosal jar articulation. Uh, not C, a secondary palate. So mammals have a denary squamosal jar articulation, a secondary palate, a jaw composed of only the dentary bone. So the correct answer, so not the neurocranium. Other animals have a neurocranium. So the correct answer for 35 is B, D, and E. All right, where are the oldest marsupial fossils found? Correct answer is B, in North America. Okay, why are there no eutherian mammals with the exception of bats, introduced species, and some rodents in Australia? And that's easy. That's because uh, the marsupials got to Australia. Austra Australia split off from the rest of Pangaea before the eutherian mammals evolved. So bats got there by flying. Dingoes were introduced by man. Sheep, horses, cows were introduced by man. Uh, rats, uh, mirrored rodents got there by sweepstakes rafting from Sulawesi. Um, so, and or on ships with uh, with uh, Europeans when Europeans arrived there. Okay. Um, So the correct answer for 37 is they evolved after Australia separated from the other continents. All right, label the following traits as being characteristic of eutherian. Okay, we're not going to do that one. Uh, let's just, uh, just for grins and giggles, though, um, you know, the scrotum is anterior to the penis in marsupials. Okay, uh, pouches are present in marsupials. Epipubic bones are pre present in marsupials. Relatively low body temperatures, that's monotremes and marsupials. Uh, presence of, of a cloaca, that's monotremes. Uh, Trabosphenic tooth, that's um, all of them. Uh, tra tra. Okay, we're going to say. Oh, one other thing is uh, lack of a corpus callosum. So that's a monotreme and marsupial attribute. Uh, so the two uh, cerebral hemispheres don't communicate with one another in monotremes and marsupials. Uh, that feature is something that shows up in placental mammals. Okay, um, the difficulty with identifying monotremes in the fossil record is they don't have teeth. Okay, so they lack teeth as adults. Uh, what's the significance of the secondary palate to mammals? Um, it allows you to eat and breathe at the same time. So the correct answer there is D. Uh, what's the significance of the denary squamosal jaw articulation to mammals? Um, uh, let's see, it frees the articular and quadrate bone to serve in other functions. Uh, that's a true statement, and it provides a more efficient shot, not really more efficient, um, not C. Yeah, so the correct answer here, it's not my favorite um, question ever, um, but it allows you to free the articular and quadrate bone to serve in other functions. What other functions, you ask? Easy. Um, 
the incus and the stapes. So the fact that you have three inner ear ossicles is because the quadrate and articular bones have left the jaw joint and migrated up into the inner ear. All right, so the bulk of mammal evolution can be explained on the basis of teeth. Why is that? Um, easy. Teeth provide the primary tool used by mammals, by mammals, let's change that, uh, to process food. Okay. Um, so mammal evolution is all about teeth. I mean, reptile, uh, reptiles, the teeth are, for the most part, pretty similar. But in mammals, boy, from one group to another, they are radically different. Okay, list three similarities between monotremes and reptiles. Easy. Uh, the pectoral girdle um, is uh, the same. Uh, um, low body temperatures, uh, or I should say heterothermy. Um, the cloaca, um, da -da -da -da. Uh, what else? Um, lack of a corpus callosum. Um, yeah. Okay, 44. Uh, why do marsupials have such short gestation periods? Because such short gestation periods, uh, they never solve the immunological problems associated with pregnancy. So the correct answer there is A. Um, very good. Uh, delayed implantation in marsupials is an evolutionary response to what? Okay. Uh, and the correct answer there is unpredictability of food and environmental conditions. Okay. So there are other animals that have delayed implantation. A lot of carnivores do that. Uh, so in other words, you have a fertilized egg, uh, which is not yet implanted on the uterine wall. Uh, and what happens in marsupials is that once um, the little joey kangaroo uh, breaks contact with the nipple, uh, that next embryo implants, and then a few weeks later, um, that small bean-like joey is born. And at that point, the female kangaroo is nursing uh, two, one almost fully developed uh, joy and then um, just a several week old joy. So the, and the milk for the, each nipple is different. All right, what is inertial homeothermy? Um, that's stability of temperature as a result of large size. Uh, that's what happened in dinosaurs and that is also what happens in cetaceans. All right, the sales of pelicosaurs. Um, remember, those are those uh, therapsid reptiles. Um, were probably used for the the old version is that they were used for locomotion across large bodies of water. Um, it now seems pretty clear that they were used in temperature regulation. So the correct answer for forty seven is D. Uh, the therapsid reptiles were um, synapsids. Okay, so they weren't diapsids. Remember, reptiles are either anapsids, as in the turtles, or diapsids, as in uh, the snakes, lizards, crocodilians, and all of those guys. Um, but the therapsid reptiles were synapsids, as are the mammals. There were also those uriapsids, uh, which have long since gone extinct. All right, number 49, the therapsids were on a direct lineage to the mammals. That is a true statement. Um, and finally, question 50, the significance of the pelicosaurs to mammals is that they reveal the importance of temperature regulation at the close of the Permian. That is true. All right, uh, that's a heck of a lot of material. Um, just to review, let's look at which questions we've uh, removed from this exam. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... 14, 15, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, uh, 38. So those are the questions we've removed. Uh, go over this exam, study this exam. Uh, I am going to take these questions, change them around a little bit, and use them on the exam that's going to be posted on uh, on the web page probably midday tomorrow. Okay. Uh, the other questions that will be on here will relate to the evolution of birds. Okay. So we had go over your bird um, 
lecture. Okay, you go over this, uh, the points that we made. It's just a few key points about birds in this review. Um, also, the one about carnivores. Okay, we made a few key points about carnivores here. And then the one about rodents. Okay, so those few key points that we made about rodents. All right, so if you go through that, uh, you'll do great. Um, the exam, I'm going to try and make it as easy as I possibly can, uh, but please study. Uh, I'm not out to sink anybody, um, and I, I want to reward you for um, the, the work that you've put in this semester. We've covered an, 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 a crazy amount of material this semester. This should be like three separate courses uh, that you're getting credit for. Alas, you only get credit for the one. Um, otherwise, uh, take care. Um, good luck on the final. Uh, if you have questions, email me. Um, the exam will be up until Thursday at noon, so uh, don't open it up and start to take it until you're ready. Uh, it is timed. Uh, it, there will probably be something like one minute per question when you're ready to take it. Uh, be prepared. When you open it up, be prepared. Uh, if, if you're going to rely on uh, looking at notes or something like that, it's going to slow you down. So um, good luck, and I hope to see you guys next semester. Take care.